Welcome to Outer Space International Arts and Class Travel Podcast. On this week's show, food, art, and some Marxist theory. An interview with Robert Sharkey. Commentary from Paul Paranoid in the space station. And the music this week from a band called Almost Infinite with a song called Off Day. I'm Rob McDonald, and I'm the host of Out of Space podcast. Um, today we have a Robert Sharkey. Hi, Robert. How are you doing? Do you call you Robert or Sharkey? What should we call you? Sharkey. Yeah. Sharkey. Okay. Smart. We'll call you Sharkey. Uh, how are you doing? You good? I'm good. Yeah. I'm good today. Yeah. Great stuff. Well, we've invited Robert on uh, Sharkey. Sorry, we've invited Sharkey on the show today to talk about uh, food. Because he's a he's a um, I would say you're a you're a you're a food activist, um, you're a food artist, you're that kind of thing. You you were part of a um, a art a sort of punk collective in uh, in Belfast where you're where you're from called called the Gyro. Um, you also work for environmental health. In fact, and you're also a socialist activist uh, uh, on top of all those things too. But you contacted the show to talk about food uh, and some ideas and things that you've got. So that's who I think you are, uh, Sharky. Who who are you? Is that correct, or is there is there more to you than that? Yeah, I would say that's pretty much correct. But um, yeah, I think I'll maybe have to add a bit of context. You know, for example, um, people from the English speaking world might know what environmental health is, but it doesn't translate. It's quite a British thing basically being a you know, food safety a safety inspector is probably the best way to translate into more common English. And then, uh, but the specialist area I've ended up working in, in, in of that is of food safety. And in, for a number of years there, I worked at one of the largest ports in the UK inspecting food imports. So that's another big... Okay, uh, so uh, if mouldy food comes from abroad, it's your fault. Is that is that more or less your job? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, so you work with food. Um, as a as an environmental uh, uh, person, um, but you also have a, a huge passion for it as well, eh? Um, to the point of being, you know, suffering for your art with food. We've talked a little bit before uh, uh, about this issue, and also, I when I introduced you, you talked that you you were part of a a collective uh, in in Belfast uh, called the Gyro collective um, could you could you explain that a little bit more and give give, give us uh, yeah. the listeners a little bit of feel of, of what kind of food activism you have been yeah. doing in the past yeah so um so the the, the collective was actually called the, the war zone collective and it was uh, started by um basically in the 1980s in belfast you had the troubles where the, the conflict that raged here for nearly 30 years you had a uh, base and at one point to try and stop IRA bombs going off in the city center. The army closed off the entire city center. And then that meant that the sort of economic life in, in the city shut down in the evenings. And at a certain point, basically there was only certain groups of workers uh, who had to work in the city center and, and young people who went in sort of colleges and things in the city center were in the, the town. And then also when the, um, the punk movement happened, then punks went into these sort of like, half dying clubs that were in the city centre and the bartenders, because their business were, were about to go bankrupt, let them take them over. But also there were a number of unemployed uh, young people and um, who were vegetarians and there's no vegetarian restaurants in the city and an unemployed resource centre helped them basically squat this dilapidated building and they turned it into Belfast's first vegetarian cafe. It then developed through a number of forms and then you had this collective developing, but it was basically just like a... Um, a very, very cheap place to get like wholesome food. And um, it was uh, consciously anti sectarian, anti racist, anti sexist space. And it de- developed over an, uh, a number of years. And it also like uh, providing sort of services for young people and like allowing um, people in sort of ba- uh, young people in bands at that time get them practice space and all. And that's where the collective came and had the music aspect. And then they started putting on gigs and things. 
Um, but really where my involvement came into it was um, a friend of mine, but Johnny Agnew, was sort of revitalizing it because it's gone through various waves. It's, it's, it's all volunteer-based and it's all like de- democratic and pe- various people have sort of taken the reins of it and been like the sort of the driving force behind it, but not definitely not any kind of, uh, it's all democratic, you know, people, uh, the sort of decisions are made collectively. And but there's there's always this sort of the various waves of, of people who are like passionately driving the, this the work of the cafe forwards. So later on, when it was sort of uh, in the nineties and also in the period I was involved in, which would have been about 2015, 16, 17, um, uh, it, it would have gone to it at various points throughout that period. But then it would have been when I was unemployed myself after leaving university. I there was a period about six months to a year where I was very active in it. And we would basically, at that point, it was more like a pop-up cafe every Wednesday night. And at that point in time, we had like, a, a, it was a pay what you can afford, pay, like pay what you feel uh, mm-hmm. model. And actually, so you get, you would say, you would get people that have... Um, Almost like food. a food ki- a food sort of kitchen kind of place. And so if you didn't have much, you needed to eat, you know, yep. you could go there for a very small amount of money and get fed. Yeah, or just sometimes if people had no money, that way they would, they would, they, yeah, but they paid five, ten pounds the previous week, or their friend would throw in some money or whatever. It was, uh, and at times it got very hectic. We managed to, I think it was in this kind of thing existing. Um, also, like because of gyros it, in the 1990s, I think it was, became uh, the food it served was uh, totally vegan. Um, I think sort of the, the kind of the anarchist types around it were sort of against animal exploitation. I'm a vegan myself, but I wouldn't make that the key thing. I really enjoyed the communal aspect of it and working with the other volunteers and creating foods. It also uh, created like the menus and the meals for it and providing food, uh, food for people. On the average night, like we would get um, anywhere between like 50 and 200 wow. people come. And so it was like quite often impossible to measure the quantities. And like it was one time... Uh, I was doing the menu that night. So you'd open up, like get all the groceries in, you know. And this this is not a professional operation. This is all volunteers doing things, totally DIY. And there was one time I was making a certain recipe, and we needed quite a lot of some Mediterranean dish. Needed quite a lot of garlic. And the first like half an hour of prep, me and my friend just friend just spent peeling cloves of garlic, like fifty, a okay. hundred cloves of garlic. <laughs> it was. It was so, yeah, a, a community kitchen then at the very best of uh with the very best of intentions a kind of mutual aid kind of place you know and obviously in those places you know you would uh develop uh relationships with other people who thought food was important because it is quite a central thing to human life having a decent meal you know um one of the things I wanted to talk about today, though, was that you contacted us as one of the listeners of the show, which is great. This is exactly what we want. Uh, And you picked up on a hypothesis uh, uh, that we've been putting on the show. And that is, I'll I'll more or less explain it. Um, That is that uh, we talked about art being um, something that was done at the when you needed to solve a problem. So it was a, the, the creative moment, if you like, was, were, came out of a need of survival. It came, it, it's not, it's not a special thing. It's something that all humans do. And that we, when we face a problem, we have to think creatively about it. And it was one of the things that me and Paul have spoke about a bit about how does art, what is art, you know, in this sense. And, We came up with that kind of hypothesis that art was nothing special. And it even goes right back to early civilizations. We We were sort of pontificating about the ideas that right back to early civilizations where people people and particularly on the Marxist left and whatever would say okay well first of all humans had to build themselves a shelter and then they had to develop hands and then the brain and and what we're throwing in there was this idea that in this evolution of humanity that they didn't just sort these things out and then go oh, let's go down the cave and paint it for some leisure time that actually creativity was in the very first moments uh di- in a dialectical way in a, in the very first moments of uh, of human development that actually they there was a need to think creatively about the problems of shelter the problems of of what to eat and these kind of questions now you picked up on that uh and we started uh, we've had a couple of conversations now and i think you've got a view 
uh, on this in terms of food and the creativity of food. And I'm kind of interested for you to expand on, 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 the, on the idea that you had it was connected to one of the show's hypotheses. So, you know, uh, take the stage and explain, explain more or less w- where you were coming from. Yeah. Um, so I, t- I think the real thing, so I was reading um, a, a book and it went basically kind of ambitious, really. It's called A People's History of the World and it explains all of the development of human society from the Stone Age to the, the, the second millennium, the, the year 2000. So it's quite ambitious and it is as dense as it sounds, you know, right, encompassing yeah. the sort of whole development of human society, uh, including this whole primitive early pe- period of human development. And I, I really picked up on something that Marxists and socialists to, to have, you know, a key thing we talk about a lot is class society and classes and class divisions. And But to have a class society, as Marx analyzed, you need to have a surplus. And I think in a in the capitalist society we live in today, that this is in commodities and money that sits in banks or offshore banks these days. But um, in in the past, for the majority of this of human history, the surplus was in grain and actual commodities, and a lot of it was to do with food and the sort of the, the if, if society went into crisis, it was quite often because there was a famine because the, because mm-hmm. the harvest failed, and that led to a crisis in in that um, society. And I and I think it's also I, I've read. A bit, a good bit about sort of that. It's not just a question of that. Actually, man evolved, and then like it's even more um, used the term dialectical relationship there. And you know, uh, so I, I, dialectics is basically the idea that um, everything is a relation of opposites. That through uh, was, you know the uh, the way I like to think about it is it's something like it's how uh, it's basically a theory of how everything can eventually become its opposite. So you have something like water can freeze and it's cold and it's solid. And then suddenly it's in a liquid form and it's, it's, it, it's can totally move out and then it can become its next form and it's steam, you know, that's the way I, I think a simple way I, I, I like to look at that theory about how things can one minute just sort of change their form. And, 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 and basically our way of viewing the world, world as Marxists is, is that things have a, our relationship with our constantly changing. Well, what does that have to do with the development of humanity? And um, basically, Engels developed on the ideas of Marx and, and said that it was even more of a relationship than, than you had and, and um, Paul had supposed that it was um, that basically, actually, it was that uh, humans evolved from apes, and it was actually the our use of tools extensively. Uh, created our hands and create and developed our minds and then this actual action of labor was what made us human and mm-hmm. so so much of this kind of early primitive labor work uh, work with with basic sort of stone age tools and even more primitive things like that just using sticks and things to and um, say knock fruit out of a tree they, these kind of things are common in apes but to get to sort of the 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 real labor where you're going. Oh, I could make a, a knife that would allow me to cut open this this um, this uh, nut from this tree, and then I can get more out of it. Or I can do that that kind of labor. Requ- it has this kind of feedback mechanism where the more that humans were able to um, gain more resources and and develop and develop, have a more developed brain, allowed more sort of specialized uh, functions in our body and our hands, and allowed for more sort of advanced labor techniques and for better tools. And this is a really long process. You know, the, the, the sort of period of recorded history and even history before that is quite short in comparison to this. These protests happened for thousands of years. Hmm. And I think that is really where it all begins. But it's, uh, you know, yeah, th- this is... So, I mean- <laughs> Just to sort of encapsulate, I mean, to give things. Let's give things some names. I mean, you're talking about a Marxist idea about how humanity develops. So you're talking about the idea it's called historical materialism, um, yeah. and you're talking about dialectics. Um, and actually, there's another another sort of a, br- a main plank of Marxism is dialectical materialism. So we're talking about two big big words, which we. Fundamentally, dialect, uh, dialectical materialism is how things change. You know, it's much more complicated than that. And may, we'll put some links in, in the descriptions and people can go and read a bit more about that. But what you're describing is the early stages of historical materialism. 
you know, um, which is like where the early human society, where we become less animals, more human, you know, where we translate from being a, a clever ape into being a stupid, in, uh, stupid, uh, I was going to say stupid Englishman, uh, into a stupid, <laughs> um, into a stupid human. Um, but, and that's what you're talking about. Yeah. The, the, those early stages of, of human developments, but in general, where does that link? Cause for me, in that process quite early on or almost at the beginning, you know, is like, there's the, there's a development of the, the shape of the hand, you know, that can yeah. pick, that can, that can manipulate at all. And mm -hmm. then, you know, if you read angles and other developed ideas along the same lines, you know, there's this uh, development of the brain that comes, you know, dialectically with it, you know, um, and those two things create labor. But actually what we're talking about there in terms of the podcast hypothesis is art, is creativity and actually making things with that ability, you know, and turning labor, uh, labor as a sense is, is creativity as well, which is, I kind of, I think you're hitting on one of the theoretical points that this podcast has to, uh, has to deal with. Um, so hopefully Paul will come back to that in the, uh, in when we go up to the podcast station later on. So that's, is that correct? Is that more or less where you're, you're, you, you've been thinking? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd say so. But, um, I think it's it's not just that it's you know you you sort of open that term there historical materialism and then I think where I think it can be a bit of a overwhelming for people to sort of go right well most people know like sort of humans came out of evolved in Africa and then developed mm. and came out of the world but that space in between is massive and there's so many developments but I think kind of as we was touching on this kind of key what Marx is called this sort of surplus that we created that allowed class societies and these great mm. civilizations, if, if you will, to form and sort of urban living and all the innovations that allowed humanity to flourish and, and come since then are, are all a product of sort of kind of a surplus, but so much of it uh, of what we call, as what Marxists would call, development of the means of production. They relate to agriculture and creating surpluses of, of, of food. And you know, we have, um, there's a big debate now about um, in this sort of, uh, evolutionary biological world about what actually created um, uh, humans. Was it what was the key thing uh, after once we had the hands that made us sort of modern humans that could think and talk, and uh, and sort of uh, brought us into the period of the Stone Age? And it is you know what was the key thing? Was it um, was it the ability to eat meat, or was it the discovery of fire, or or were these all part of a process that created humans? And and it's been, it's very difficult because the, the actually is there's, there's various bits of, of like sort of classical Marxists more than 100 years we've written about this like and Marx and Engels and um, but then evolutionary biologists today still haven't found enough evidence to agree on what the actual mm. single cause of this was uh, well I think there's one thing that's worth clarifying there and this is this question you talked about was surplus just from a sort of theoretical point of view, because I remember when I was uh, first coming in contact with sort of left wing ideas and I read some marks and what sparked, sparked my brain was this question of surplus in society and that really all that socialism was, was about redistribution, the surplus and all capitalism was about was um, is that somebody owned the surplus once it had been made, you know, and basically it's a surplus what's made extra on top of existence. So you need the basics and then when you got extra, and I think you were talking about it then as well in terms of food production, you know, um, and agriculture and stuff. So obviously early human societies were about making sure that people ate and, and water as well, um, you know, and drank. So, what I'd like you to do now then is with your recipe ideas in a creative way, um, it's, it's not quite like a doing a poem or doing a song, but in, in a creative way, maybe give us some examples of what, uh, of what you actually mean. Um, in, in, and, in, and I believe in the form, you're going to do it in the form of recipes from some of these early societies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like the first one I'd like to talk about is a dish I discovered online that some people have recreated um, and it would be a staple of, Sort of the Marxist issues are primitive, but it's actually related to um, the first stage and sort of the development 
uh, of societies, what we call Marxist primitive communism. And uh, Native Americans lived for large parts of, of their existence through in, in this kind of society. So right up until basically the, the, the colonists conquered America, you had, they were still eating. This is their staple of some kind of mix malize, which basically they would alkalize the corn and mix it and make a stew of these kind of vegetables. There were there other things that would like forage a lot of vegetables. You have a lot of like wild onion type vegetables in North America and various nuts and seeds and things they would they would supplement the diet with. But they they ate a lot of these kind of um this was this like the staple. This, the, these were the three pillars of, the, of their food mm. to give them stability. Um, there was also, they also like would, would hunt the buffalo and eat meat and things, but these were the key sort of pillars of what allowed them to uh, uh, to have um, permanent kind of populations and a stability to their their groups. Um, okay, so that, that's the first one, the three sisters um, stew. And is, is that? I mean, that's one way of calling it, I guess. Well, what's the second one? So the next Senate side is developed. Uh, great, like, so what you have is um, slavery developed in a massive way, and that, that ended up being a massive um, problem because um, slave, slave societies allow sort of extreme exploitation of these people that have been taken almost always in war. And, and these slave societies were incredibly brutal. Um, and then they ended up sort of destroying themselves and quite a, like, quite a good way to describe it. It's quite cannibalistic, actually, because they go out and expand, take slaves. The, the, the wealthy, the, the, the people at the top, could have created a massive um, um, uh, amount of wealth and luxuries for themselves. But then it fundamentally collapses. And you have, um, and this happened all over Europe. You have Rome and the Greek city states. But then actually, an interesting development happened was Asia ended up becoming a massive reservoir for the culture and uh, the, 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 the discoveries that happened in terms of innovation and technology. And you have an entire dynasty that was this kind of in China that was a Chinese emperor called the, the Song Dynasty that, that is kind of still considered the height of um, Chinese, um, civil, uh, Chinese early uh, culture. And basically his uh, entire empire is quite lucky in that they were raiding and they, they um and they got a um a uh an offering of this kind of rice innovation that was made in Southeast Asia and allowed you to get a bountiful harvest. You get two harvests in one, and this allowed for a massive surplus of rice and it it actually stabilized Asia for a thousand years and it meant that um that um that, that, that these societies were stable and were able to um to keep and develop, keep on developing society when you know, the population in Europe had halved and plagues were ravaging all of Europe and it was dominated by wars and um, Rome was getting sacked by the Visigoths. But you also had in China this, this massive class division um, where you had the group formally broke up and you know you had this trading class but they were suppressed by the, the imperial court and, and you, but you also had the, the peasants who, went, who were starved at the very bottom. So part of this as well is, is that you have um, you have what was called a forbidden uh, rice, and there was certain things were forbidden for ordinary people. And you had this natural diversity in rice where black rice would develop. And because it was forbidden for peasants and ordinary people to eat it, you could even be put to death for, for, eat, for eating this kind of rice because it was only it would all be taken basically and, and given as a sort of gift to the, the court. And it was only for the most wealthy, and it was to be eaten because it's, it contains natural sort of pigments. The, uh, the rice itself is very like jet black and it contains the same kind of anthocyanin pigments, the pigments that are make blueberries and blackberries dark. I, I thought this was quite an interesting whole period of history. So mm. I, uh, I've eaten like actually one of the dishes I made at Jairo's one time, like the first time I ever cooked with black rice was at one of the cafes we did there. And at that time I was quite fascinated with this, this thing I'd never seen before and I made quite a few dishes with it then. But I had the idea of making like an Asian kind of rice bowl with it, where you have like ingredients that would be, would be available available at the time. So like I was reading a thing recently about how pak choy, a kind of Chinese leaf vegetable, was uh, innovated, but okay. for as a kind of gift to the imperial court. And you so you're going to do it. You're going to do a gift for this imperial court of a of a <laughs> black of, of a for me and Paul and Jonas uh, of a of a, of a black rice dish. Yeah. Okay, so that's yeah. like the second one. What was the third? What's the third one? Yeah, so you then have. So I briefly mentioned there. You have like you know the like Europe was in crisis in this period when uh, uh, China was uh, and China and the, the rest of Asia was flourishing, 
And then you have um, basically what happens is the, the Roman Empire collapses, is you then have uh, this sort of slow uh, process of over the centuries it collapsing into, surf, uh, into feudalism and serfdom, where basically the nobility were just able to control a small patch, where in the previous period in Rome, they were able to control the entire, uh, the entire European continent. And this meant that actually all food products were very limited. You know, you could only get commodities. There was uh, like this whole period was marked by um, the almost complete uh, disappearing of any kind of real trade, of the circulation of money. You know, it's the dark ages. And this meant that you had this nobility class who were almost all powerful, you know, but the layer of nobility that was beneath them. And they would do this through like great feasts and they would have banquets. But one dish in particular, I think that, that, that fascinated me, I'd made it for years before I learned this history about it, is it's called uh, Ribolita. And it literally translates from Italian, the reboiled. Uh, Ribolita. Com- yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. And it's, um, it's a reboiled stew and it comes from the cook's for the, the nobility in their, in their kitchens would make uh, as part of the, the daily meal um, a vegetable soup. And then they, they, they were in this period, they had um, like, uh, would be served their, their meals on like uh, plates made of bread. And that's where your bread with the meal would be. And then they would take leftovers of this and then put it in the leftovers of the vegetable soup. And that's what the servants and the cooks and all the, um, the, the sort of lower people in the court that were that were um, below the uh, the nobility would eat, and I discovered another fact about this that I find very interesting that, that actually how this ended up sort of leaving the luxurious the sort of um, only being the exclusive preserve of the diets of the nobility and and kind of being a byproduct of just being in in the king's castle and being being in that kind of environment. You then are having been uh, spread in sort of the late feudal period as a dish across the region, because in the sort of late feudal period you have a mass. You have all these inventions like ploughs weren't used in Europe until less than a thousand years ago, and you have this massive expansion of like actual. You also have the black to heft as well, but you also have this massive expansion in the population of Europe and more peasants, and that there being surplus created. We also have this degeneration of feudalism, where they're demanding more luxuries, more heavily expensive wars. And that's putting more pres- pressure on the peasantry, and you also have uprisings. And this is what like Marx talks about, you know, really when he talks about the history being of class struggles. And so, what this relates back to Rebolita is it became tax in the 15th century that put on salt on, on the population by the nobility in um, what is modern day Tuscany. And it's it, this is kept to get this today. They still have this kind of bread, this salt free, very hard bread. Mm. But it's the way it's baked; it, it, it preserves very well. Um, but this is the tr- still the traditional kind of bread used to make okay, ribolita. This goes with ribolita. Uh, this type of bread is a, okay. Interesting. So tax bread <laughs> with ribolita. That's that's the third one. So what, what's the, what's the fourth one? So ribolita. I really like it, it's talking about it because it actually connects with all these things. Because they actually, I managed to find like quite an authentic recipe. You know, because we think about Italian like Mediterranean cooking. Now you're thinking of you know, tomatoes, chili peppers, and um, you might be having polenta. You know, um, or, or um, it might be having gnocchi, maybe potatoes. You know, in the, in the feudal period, none of these these things have been brought to Italy or Europe at all because the the what was called the Columbian Exchange hadn't happened. So, while Columbus definitely didn't discover the Americas, he um, the, the what this there was this massive process of exchange of goods from the old world uh, from the old world from from Europe and Asia of things like uh, of wheat. And also the animals like horses and pigs uh, with uh, commodities that um, today, like the, that we sort of revere today, like corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, chocolate uh, being the one that uh, everyone forgets about. And then you have the period really actually known as precursor to capitalism. You know, this is the period of history where actually think people are a bit more comfortable with having knowledge of and it's a bit more relatable. So you have with capitalism, you have the massive uh, commodification when you're talking about goods and and. I think the key thing on how it relates to food is the the ruling class to always try and take more and more from those beneath them, and then the, the, those at the bottom will always like innovate and cr- trying to find a creative solution and a way to get out. And this creates real innovations within, which I think Rebelate is a good example of that. But also you have by capitalism this this um, pressing together on and factory production being a key thing. You have these massive events that change the face of the world, like the French Revolution, the American Re- Revolution. But I think a key thing to sort of understand is the, the sort of the creation of nation states, but also the massive 
pushing together workers that would have been separate apart in the countryside and creating these kind of factory environments. And I haven't been able to find like a really good history for it, but the last dish I'd like to talk talk about is a thing called chakalaka, which is uh, the other name for it is sweato jelly. And it is a real hodgepodge kind of, well, could have only been created in, um, in, in these conditions of sort of uh, capitalism about a hundred years ago. And it became the kind of staple dish of Mozambican um, mine workers in South Africa who were brought in to sort of undercut local labor in, in the early apartheid state. And they took this dish, it's basically like they did not, these people lived basically in shanty towns, they didn't have access to refrigeration. And this was like a like spicy, but also like hearty and, and nutritious dish to have with their basic just like meal, maize-based porridge. And it was made of grated carrots, peppers, and tomatoes, and, the, and and fresh herbs. But also, like it's a legacy of colonial rule in uh, in of South, of that part of Africa. That the, the one of the key components of it is tinned beans. Mm. And well, our hinds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but it also includes, you know, a massive influence in that area is the, the in the colonial period. Uh, Britain brought the sort of um, new Indian tr- spices along that along that route and that was sort of the, the the way ships brought the spices so spices in, in that period in that sorry place have a long history and the, the, these like dishes would have had uh, like this dish has like a quite a heavy dose of like indian chilies and her- herbs like mm. coriander and like in, indian so spices a, wor- in a world dish in that sense yeah. in a, in one of the inter- inter- interesting well i think what we've tried to do there is understand the whole history of the world <laughs> in half an hour uh, with all the theories that are necessary to do it and throw in that food production and a load of, and, and, and some of the key ingredients and, and, and recipes. And I think that was quite ambitious of us to try and fit that into a half an hour, 40 minute slot. But I think what we've done there is we've, we've created um, well, two things. One, I think we've created a basis for a discussion you know, uh, on on food production, human development, and where the creativity of recipes and how to make food comes in. And I'm, I just want to hold it there because there's a whole lot of stuff. And I think we can, we can, you know, hopefully people will interact with the show and they will come up with, ah, he's talking rubbish. It's not called that. It's called this. Or, you know, they'll come up with other things where food production and the creativity of making food uh, uh, comes into. And obviously there's a whole art form around food, which we haven't even touched on. You know, that's on presentation um, uh, and on how to use and the mixing of ingredients, a whole load, whole load of area. But in this podcast, it's the opener on the question of, of, of food. I just want to ask you, though, oh, oh, just one other thing as well. I think you're going to try and make us some, um, not recipes as such, but you're going to try and make it like a gift or, or, you know, I mean, so that we can make make what you've explained into to show people, yeah? Is that correct? Yeah. Is that what you're thinking of doing? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have all these kind of, like I said, the experience of gyros. The gyros are very internationalist. And what, and yeah. what I've realized as well is in, uh, recipes that are written in sort of the traditional format that comes from sort of the English language yeah. and actually is a colonial period and written down recipe books, they don't translate well. I hate, I hate recipes. I, when, <laughs> I, when I see a recipe, I just think, uh, well, it tells me what should be in it more or less. And yeah. I don't like to look at the, the the quantities. Now, sometimes that makes it go badly. Uh, and I've had a, I've had a long battle of making the perfect Yorkshire pudding, you know, and I could have done a whole <laughs> show on, on that. And it's basically flour, eggs, and, you know, it's about it and water and a little bit of salt. Some people put oil. Anyway, so the, you, you want to do something creative that's moving away from the traditional recipes to show these things that you, these four food sources that you've talked about. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to, you're going to try and, you're going to try and create something for us. Yeah. Uh, to show people. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, I was thinking, I was what, just are you, what, you, what have you put yourself up for? Go and try and explain yeah, it no, now. I've... And then we'll see, we'll give you the artistic license to fuck it up. Um, <laughs> uh, we've said it now in the podcast It's out there that people can look in the description and they can try and find what you didn't manage to do. But what, what, what's your att- what are you going to attempt to do for us? Yeah, I, I think you like not as you get like a lot of people watch recipes on on YouTube and there's a lot like social media is full of them all the time like Instagram and these kind of things are just filled with food like that's the main like young people are supposedly obsessed with you know food or our generation and then what I wanted to do was trying to do something creative but it also would be quite easy to distribute because it was you told me years ago about actually a key thing of capitalism in the art is 
the, these days is, is for these ideas to be just replicated easily. That you can just go, what do you make for dinner? Oh, that sounds amazing, mate. Oh, can you send me that recipe? Yeah, and but you, I also wanted it because this is an international thing to be able to be something that would break through language. And so I want to try and make like a thing with pictures and videos that doesn't actually really have any language at all in it. So people can go, oh, what's that ingredient he's using? Oh, I wouldn't know that in my language, but oh, it's it's an onion, you know? It's because there's a recipe I was trying to recently. I was like, what is that? And it was like in some dialect of Spanish because it translated it badly via Google, <laughs> and I couldn't translate the word. I was like, what is this? Oh, oh, it's, and then I managed to find a video of the recipe. It was just a leak, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Well, let's let's see how you get on uh, with that. Um, I did have a final question for you. We, we're very short of time now, but I'm gonna fr- I'm gonna throw it to you anyway because we're we're still in COVID, you know, uh, and the the understood way that 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 uh, d- that uh, virus got into uh, humanity was through what is it suspected through bats, eh? And that's about food production. So it's just a general last question, as I quite often do it. I ask a massive question at the end of the interview that can't possibly be answered, but is a bit of a, a bit of a seed for the next time maybe we talk to you. And what do you think we should be doing on the left uh, and as socialists and as activists about the question of food production in general? Do you have a you know a, a view on it? Yeah, I think for me personally, like. So this does come a bit from the fact I'm a vegan and like you're just told like there's a lot of lies in society and like the idea, you know, some are prevalent and are getting dispelled. Like the idea of women have a less role in society. And, you know, a hundred years ago, that idea was very prevalent. Now it's less now. But a lot of these are related to food. Like uh, in, in my opinion, there's a lot of lies told about that. And I think this does relate to the question of the environment, environmental destruction. Basically, capitalism keeps on trying to create like a global industrialized food systems and, and massive uh, conglomerates are trying to do more uh, continually and create more profit with less. You know, the way the agriculture is today, it depletes the soil uh, and um, it, it damages the earth's ecosystems. You, ha- you have the majority of deforestation and the destruction of natural habitats happens because of the expansion of, you know, livestock production, in particular beef. And it, it's quite interesting on this issue. Um, so it actually links back again to something we were talking about earlier, one of the reasons why vir- this must sound quite complicated to a lot of people, but I read this really interesting book about pandemics and explained why um, viruses evolve in this way. So actually, basically, what happens is when an ecosystem is put under pressure, they, that so the bats have quite um, they have quite easily mutatable d- DNA, and these viruses live happily within the, the the bats and don't cause them any illness. But when the ecosystem they live in is put masses under pressure and say the trees that they eat their fruit out of are knocked down to create a, a livestock plantation and, and grow, you know, pangolins, these animals that are, are uh, put in these wet markets in China, the virus actually reacts because of the stress in the animal, the pressure that's put on that population. The virus acts in a defensive mechanism. This is quite an, uh, yeah. this, this new part of evolutionary biology and it's like a theory uh, scientists have now to explain viruses. It, 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 the, the case study they use is about Ebola and Ebola never left because it's such that people, these the viruses are so dangerous. They're like, well, why, how could this virus still exist if it's so deadly? But actually it has this basically cohabiting mechanism with the animal that it's existed with for thousands of years where it tries to defend the animal the, the, this 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 unknown this unknown force is pushing into its ecosystem and it's trying the virus is pushing it back out again so so well, your solution is a vegan diet and stop eating bats uh, not quite i think <laughs> one, I remember one last point because I, I don't want to take to, to, to up to Hassan. like i don't know if you've seen like we live in a world full of billionaires, you know, this, 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 this Twitter page that's, uh, you know, definitely a socialist runs it. It's, a, uh, it's formed in, uh, recently called uh, Did Jeff Bezos uh, End World Hunger Today? And it just regularly posts, no, Jeff Bezos decided with his massive wealth not to end world hunger today. Right. Uh, so these billionaires, they could world end world hunger and all these issues my entire life we've been told about, you know, we just need to give another £10 to hear this mm. you know, special concert and, Famine in Africa will be solved. We have fundamental problems. They're about. They're about the. These are systemic problems that we need to fundamentally change society and our economic system. And I think that's why I want to relate to an understanding of the world and about how humanity's developed. And actually, that's a key part of Marxism. Is that Marx saw not capitalism as the end or any kind of these sort of people you get today that go, oh, we're now post-capitalist and it's some other weird society and technology can change. No, we need to have, bring a fundamental change and bring about a socialist society where the needs of everyone are met 
and there's no one starving and that's what we call a, a, a social society and I think you'd agree with that, wouldn't you? Yeah, and I think it comes back to the point we started to talk about, which was about surplus. So thank you, Sharkman. Uh, we will get you back um, and uh, look forward to speaking to you again. Okay, mate? Yeah, hey, thank you. Okay, take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, then let's make our way up to the space station. Uh, Paul, are you up there? Hi, Rob. I'm here. How you doing? Hey, man. Good, good. Uh, and uh, so what did you think of uh, Sharky's contribution? Wow. Wow. That was really interesting. Um, I'm going to be asking you for some help here because there was a lot of information. I enjoyed it and I've listened to it more than once and it's 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 got a lot there's a lot going on what I grasped from it which I'm going to ask you to give me some more on is like there was a lot of stuff about well you having a lot of information about Marxism and and stuff like that I thought maybe you could help lead me through a kind of a framework yeah of where from. I, I mean yeah, I, get, I think it's worth reframing it because I think what Sharky's talking about here is quite sort of um, he, he's he's putting he, he's listened to a h hypothesis that we've had on the show, which I'll come to in a minute, and he's brought the idea of food into that hypothesis, uh, and he's talked about uh, a central Marxist theoretical idea, uh, and the name of that idea is historical materialism. And the fundamentals of that is that history, human history, the driving force of human history is the means of production and labor. And what we mean by that in modern speak is the economy. You know, so the driving force of society is the economy. But Marxist ideas talk about the, de the development from an ape to man um, being the development of, <coughs> uh, um, of the thumb. Um, not yeah. disposable thumb. What's it called? The um, opposable thumbs. That's the one. Yeah, um, and that that was the beginning of that was man being able to or humans uh, being able to make tools, complicated yeah. tools, and because they can make complicated tools, that's the means of production, you know. And therefore, human modern humans, you know, evolve at that moment out of apes. You know, there was just what the group of humans could get together, but they were developing a society. And then as as society develops, classes develops um, on the basis that there's surplus in society. You know, so, you know, there's uh, the, reli the religious class develops, the ruling classes develop because somebody has to decide what happens to the profit. And so this is this is the Marxist theory of historical materialism, which is the driving force of humanity for Marxists. It's what uh, moves society forward. And what Sharkey picked up on, which is dead correct, is that in our first show, we talked about the idea of creativity being part of that early process of, of man you know man's development so you know we we kind of hypothesized of this moment where it wasn't just the development of the thumb and then the means of production but creativity was there at the beginning you know and i mentioned it in the discussion with sharky that you you know the cavemen didn't go oh well now we've done our work we're gonna let's go down let's go down the cave and paint it for a crack you know because painting and art is just a secondary thing no creativity is something it's that very moment of labor you know you and so it's entwined in that and that's what we've been talking about on and off throughout the uh, the, uh, the show so Chucky picked up on that and he's saying yeah this is this is good but also food plays a really important role here in terms of uh, uh, of how you can understand the development of human history on the basis of this historical Marxist perspective. And I think that's where he was coming from. And then what he, once we talked about the basic theory and uh, we started to drop in these ideas, these different recipes in different historical moments that reflected the society of the day, you know, and therefore I, it was, you, do you, you yeah, see what I'm saying? 
yeah i i felt like that bit and i follow you thank you for that and i, and I, I thought that bit was like sharky was doctor who and he took us in his tardis <laughs> and he said first of all i'm gonna take <laughs> and he took us yes to the, absolutely it took us the full periods of history to show us and i'm just, I hey, Paul, thinking, I'm just thinking that maybe i've seen sharky with a long scarf on <laughs> It's possible, but, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. No, it's a very good It's a very good way of putting it because we went into then this whirring, sharky ti- time lord uh, jumping from one society to another society and uh, uh, fascinating, fascinating stuff. Really good insight, I think, to try. And, and I think he was honest and, and in the discussion. We were saying, like, we're putting this on the table. Why don't people discuss it? What role does food play in this, in you know, food production uh, and all this? What does this play in 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 the historic in the history of humans? And where does creativity fit in with that? And I think what I liked about how he was trying to put it across is that he's got this great passion for food. He works in food in an official capacity, but he's also got this you know this other side to him, which is a food activist and and a lover of all things foodie. Um, and then he tries to, um, what's the word? He tries to create some um, some recipes out of these historical moments. Well, you know, right. to, I was say, if we step into Sharky's TARDIS and just really briefly just visit each of the four periods of history, well, just to sort of like flag them they're up. They're bigger on the inside and they look on the outside. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. I mean, I remember the, the first one. Uh, yeah. The first one was the was the Native Americans. Yeah. Um, and this was really interesting because this is like, this was like the, if you like, the primitive communist society, the early society where, yeah. you know, there wasn't much surplus um, and that they used, I think, three different main f- food sources and that they had, uh, I can't remember exactly what they were. I think they were um, beans, a squash and there was something else and they caught, they grew yeah. them all together in a cycle with the land, you know. Gotcha. Um, I thought that, was, and I, I thought that was a very interesting, you know, the three had, sisters, three sisters. I think that's what it was called. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was the first. What was the second? Um, um, and that was like early, early, early societies he was talking about there. And then we went back in, we got back in the toilets and it took us to China. Ah, yes. In, uh, yes. In the era black, of one of the black imperial... rice, I think it was black. Yes. Rice? Yes. That's yep. what I've got uh, here. And I think I think he talks about that in the sense that the, the this, uh, this Chinese emperor went on a raiding mission, and when he came back, he came back with this really cool rice that he nicked basically from somewhere. I think yeah. it was maybe Thailand or something. I don't know if that's correct. And then you know, and so that was another reflection of of, uh, of what was sort of a slavery based society. Um, yes. What was the third one? Do you remember the third the, one? Italy. We got in the TARDIS and he took us to Italy. Ah, it was around the collapse of the Roman Empire, the beginning of feudalism, wasn't it? That kind yeah. of... What was it called again? Yeah. Do you remember? Now, the, 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 dish, the dish was um, Ribolita or Ribolita. Uh, uh, Ribolita, yeah, Ribolita, that's it. And it was a, a, re, a rehashing of, uh, of stuff and re-boi- it meant reboiling. Um, it's the, it, there was something about the uh, the, the, the uh, nobility enjoying the sort of labours of uh, ah yes as the society was and, collapsing they would they yeah. would they would they would a bit like the rich do still today you know they show off how fucking great they are you know and they spend all their money on ridiculous things um, but yeah. actually it's, the poor it's, it's, had to sort of assemble what was left and the leftovers and they created this stew out of what the nobility didn't yes. want and or threw you know, away. I, and also, he talked about how all the things we see as Italian now weren't there then, because there hadn't been this sort of culinary crossover in, in terms of a historical understanding. And I think that's very important. And and that's why it was fascinating to link these food questions with the development of human yeah. society. And, and, and there was a really important bit about the bread, because they put a tax on salt to squeeze oh, the right. yeah. existence of the poor some more. And so they had to develop this bread that could work without salt. And, and, and that sort of bread, I forgive me, I've forgotten the name of it, but it was a bread remember. specifically... They probably said it in Sainsbury's, didn't they? <laughs> and, 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 and of course now it's part of culture or whatever, and it, it was designed to go, and, and the, the flavour of it, and the flavour of, I think, Ria Bolita was, was, I've said it wrong, haven't I, Ria Bolita, but basically it was designed so the two would complement each other and get around that problem of not having any salt in the bread, and it all kind of came together, and it was, the whole thing is almost like a mini commentary on the sort of societal, sort of Well, like, there was one last one at the end, which was bringing it... And there was one last one at the end. Was, 
Chakalata from Southern Africa, and it had all the mix of different uh, international stuff and Heinz baked beans and all, all, all these kind of things. Uh, and so, yeah, it was like a it was quite a quite a, a, a dent. I think it was a dent. I think we can say it was a dense interview, can't we? It was quite a lot in there. It, it was there was a lot to unpick. It was joyous, but so diff. I mean, no, 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 no criticism of of Sharky, but a lot of information. But we've done our best to sort of like signpost it there, I think. And I'm I've had to listen to it more than once, um, and I'm going to try and listen to it a few more times as well, because it was. There was a for someone like me who isn't as well educated on either history or Marxism or, or, or the nature of the economy as yourself. It was a crash course, and I'm grateful for that. Well, I think you that's know? the idea. Actually, I think that's where he was coming from. It was like, let's talk about a different way of explaining an idea, and that in itself was the creative moment in this. And what he said near the end and when we talked about it a little bit we talked about this idea that he's going to do some a different way of explaining recipes and he's going to make some gifts you know like little yeah. mini videos um and i talked about to him since and said how are you getting on he is working on it um i haven't seen them yet uh but we did i did say we put them up on the website um with maybe some written stuff with them as well although the idea was that they would work without writing and it, out of each of these four different foods that he talked about he's going to give us a recipe so i think there's a bit of a challenge there uh, to ourselves and to anybody listening who fancies it is to look at these gifts um i find it always strange to say gifts i i, I want to put the t on the end it's gifts I know, I know. you know um what does it stand for does anybody know gifts anyway i've seen i've seen one of them is like graphic but i don't know okay Okay, so well, anyway, so, so I don't know what I'm talking about. But uh, he's going to put them up. I think we should try and... Uh, I'm going to try and make at least one of them on the basis of no recipe because I said in the interview, and it's true, when I cook, I cook like... Um, uh, what do you call those painters? They, they go in the room and they throw pots of paint around Pollock. and roll around on the Jackson floor. Pollock. Yeah, that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sort of this sort of. Uh, that's that, that's the kind of artist I would be with food. You know, I, the <laughs> kitchen is a disaster when I finish, but actually I'm pretty good because I think I'm quite creative with it. So, well, yeah, I think I mean we could wind it up there. Um, I yeah, think. Oh, one other thing. Challenge. Well, as we're talking about food and coming up to the seasonal, uh, the seasonal season, that's not quite the right way of putting it, is it? As we come up to Christmas, just let people know that we have started to discuss the idea about doing a Christmas special, um, but we're not going to do it in the normal way. And I think it'd be nice to sort of tie up our, our message, if you like, in a Christmas show. So I think that's we'll leave it there just in case it collapses and we don't do it. Um, and then we can edit this bit off. Um, yeah, but a little a little nod to to everybody who, who likes the show. We're going to we're going to go for a Christmas special at some point. OK, so well, I, Jonas is turning up the volume on us. We're obviously I think we did quite well this time. We didn't go on for too long. Um, but I shall see you again next week, Paul, and you, you take good yeah, care. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, give my regards to Sharky for a great interview. I will do, man. I will do. Take care now. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Sharky, for talking about the history of food and its connection to human history. And if you are interested to try out one of his recipes, you can do that on our website, where you can also find a link to donate if you want to support the show. I will now leave you with a song called Off Day by the band Almost Infinite from Cincinnati in the USA. Enjoy!
We hope you enjoyed the show. If you have something to say to us, then join our Facebook group or contact us at outerspace.com. That's O-U-T-A hyphen space dot com. See you soon. <laughs>